From A and D, this is Biography. Mao Zedong brought the Communist Revolution to China and gained political power through the barrel of a gun. The Chinese system he overthrew nearly 50 years ago was backward and corrupt. Few would argue the fact that he dragged China into the 20th century. But at a cost in human lives that is staggering. Suspected enemies of the party were murdered by the millions. Farming collectives and the great leap forward of industrialization that failed miserably and left millions more dead from starvation. Mao left a system of oppression that continues to this day, even as China moves forward with economic reforms and towards a central position on the world stage. For 25 years, Mao Zedong ruled one quarter of the world's population. He turned China from a feudal backwater into one of the most powerful countries in the world. I would say he was a genius. Even those who oppose him, who curse him, would say the same. But behind a wall of silence, we know he presided over the deaths of tens of millions of his countrymen. Mao was more like Stalin than Hitler, but he was responsible for many more deaths than either of them. He ruled as an emperor, but remained a simple man. We know that he didn't like to wash, that he was rubbed down with wet towels every night. We know that he never brushed his teeth. He was a peasant. This is the story of a man who was praised in his lifetime as a god, but may be judged in the future as one of the bloodiest dictators of the 20th century. China, the last important bastion of communism in the world. For more than 50 years, the country's history has been dominated by the shadow of one man, Mao Zedong. He's still revered as the founding father of modern China, the man who turned Marxism into Maoism and gave the Chinese people a new dignity and self-respect. People believe that Mao Zedong could bring happiness to them. There's a popular song called The East is Red, which goes, The East is Red, the Sun is Risen. Mao Zedong has appeared in China. Mao came from a peasant family. His parents and grandparents before them owned a three and a half acre plot of land in the village of Shaoshan Chan. It's a small hamlet in the province of Hunan in southern China. It was here, in a house which is now a museum, that Mao was born on December 26, 1893. China was a feudal society where a small elite lived well and millions barely survived. In the cities, opium addiction was widespread. In the countryside, feudal landlords ruled like kings and extorted punitive taxes. There were frequent peasant rebellions, which were bloodily suppressed. Life was tough and brutal. Mao's family were better off than many. His father, Mao Jianshen, was a self-made man with a quick temper who believed in the virtues of hard work and often beat his sons. <laughs> 
Mao and his two younger brothers were much happier with their mother, Wen Chi Mei, an illiterate but devout Buddhist who tried to shelter them. Mao was very close to his mother. He would spend a lot of time arguing with his father. In his old age, when he went back to visit his parents' graves, Mao said his mother had been more important to him than his father. By the age of six, the young Mao was already toiling for long hours in his father's fields. He got a brief education, but by the time he was 13, he was working full time on the family farm. He grew increasingly restless. He lacked adequate education, and then he also had an inordinate ambition. And uh, this is a pretty volatile combination, and he really didn't know what to do with himself. But he always had uh, a voracious appetite for reading and a kind of spirit of radical adventure. When he was 14, his father arranged for him to marry a local girl. But Mao knew by now that he wanted to escape the confines of village life, and he never accepted or lived with her. Three years later, when he was 17, he finally left home and caught a boat to the bustling regional capital of Changsha, where he planned to enroll in a proper school. Almost immediately, he found himself caught up in a revolution. For years, China had been ruled by a corrupt and ineffectual monarchy. The country was falling apart. The monarchy was now overthrown by a modernizing republican movement, headed by the Kuomintang, or Nationalist Party. Mao reveled in the upheaval. Though in Shangsha, there was relative calm. He enrolled in a teacher training college, but as a gesture of support for the rebellion, cut off his traditional Chinese pigtail, until then a capital offense. There were roving bands of bandits. It was a time when a patriotic youth, and Mao was certainly that, wandered with a China. He joined a student group and dreamed of a new China. He believed in the importance of physical well-being. We know this because one of his friends from his youth wrote a book about their life together and how Mao had persuaded him and a few others to tramp across the countryside during the holidays, crossing streams and going up mountains because he felt that if patriotic young people were going to save China, they had to be healthy and strong in order to do it. In 1918, he qualified as a teacher. He was 24. In the same year, his much-loved mother died. Mao had no incentive to go home and left for the capital, Beijing, to look for a job. The city was full of young men trying to make a living. Mao had difficulty finding work. He eventually found a lowly job at the university and moved into a room in a poor part of the city, which he shared with seven other people. Mao was an assistant in the Beijing library. And I think for him, this was as close as he could get to a university education. Um, he was treated with a derision by the other students, by the students. He also, um, I think, was extremely frustrated by the level of this position. It was now, mingling with the students, that Mao heard about the communist revolution in Russia. He was fascinated by it. It seemed to offer new hope for the downtrodden peasants of his own country. Mao became a revolutionary Marxist and an inaugural member of the Chinese Communist Party. It was a small group that got together and Mao was there uh, 
as a sort of representative of the uncouth masses, you might say. Uh, nobody took him seriously at all. Mao returned to his home province of Hunan to preach communism to the peasants. With him, he took his new wife, the daughter of one of his old school teachers. But there was little time for family life. China was now run by a fierce anti-communist called Chiang Kai-shek. In 1927, he clamped down on his radical opponents. Thousands of communist supporters were brutally rounded up. Many were beaten and shot. Mao fled with his family and a straggling band of communists to the remote and inaccessible mountains of Jiangxi in southern China, a place he knew from his youth. He was in his late 30s, a marked man with a price on his head of a quarter of a million silver dollars. He was about to emerge as the most important revolutionary figure in China. In the remote hills of Jiangxi, the battered remnants of the Chinese Communist Party regrouped. Mao and his comrades were now outlaws with a price on their heads. They seized land and started to build a military base. By the late 1920s, they were attracting a steady stream of supporters. Mao was in his element. He loved the ceaseless movement, the danger, and the excitement. But he knew it wouldn't be long before Chiang Kai-shek's government attacked. Mao and other communists realized they had to build an army. And gradually, and with great difficulty, you know, peasants don't actually want to be guerrilla warriors. They want to just till their crops. They've got families to look after. And Mao found it very difficult to build up uh, a guerrilla army. But gradually, in various base areas, they did build up such an army, and it became a threat. Mao was learning to become a skillful and ruthless organizer, though he hid it behind a facade of great charm. Mao exuded a kind of basic simplicity. He wore very simple clothes. His clothes were full of cigarette burns. Uh, he scratched himself in public. Uh, he would do all kinds of... Um, he would commit what might be called charming vulgarities, uh, which made people feel, feel very comfortable, sometimes even superior to him. The communists became a threat the government could not ignore. And in 1930, Chiang Kai-shek attacked. The communists were hopelessly outnumbered and outgunned. If they relied on conventional military tactics, they'd be wiped out. It was now that Mao wrote his famous guide to guerrilla warfare. Never take the enemy head on. Retreat when he advances, attack when he rests. One of the early victims was Mao's wife and companion, Yang Kaihui, who was killed in a guerrilla raid. Six months later, as government troops closed in, Mao married again. His new wife was a guerrilla fighter called Ho Tse Chen. But it was a marriage lived on the run. By 1934, there were close to one million government soldiers surrounding the communist camp. Even guerrilla warfare became impossible. The communists faced decimation and were forced to withdraw. As they did so, they argued about what to do next. Most of the leaders wanted to make a heroic last stand. Mao, almost alone, counseled against it. 
and after weeks of retreat, punctuated by military defeats, he forced a showdown. He chose just the right moment when people were really fed up. They'd march hundreds and hundreds of miles, and they didn't know where they were going, and he seized that opportunity to, to force a confrontation at which he was able to take over leadership. It was a historic confrontation, the moment Mao became the unquestioned leader. He set out from Zhangxi in the south on the greatest strategic retreat in military history, a 6,000-mile trek across China to Shangxi in the north. It became known as the Long March. The communist soldiers were attacked all along the route and paid an appalling price. Of the 100,000 people who set out, less than 20,000 survived. Yet the long march saved the communists from almost certain extinction and turned Mao into a living legend. At school, we learned how Mao and the Red Army climbed snowy mountains and waded across vast swamps. They were very heroic. They sacrificed their lives for China and for the liberation of the Chinese people. I worshipped them, of course. A year later, in 1936, the beleaguered communists straggled into the isolated northern city of Yan'an, too remote for the government forces to reach them. Then as now, Yan'an is an impoverished market town, surrounded by steep mountains and forgotten by successive governments. Mao and the other communist leaders settled into the cave houses typical of the region. As word spread that he had established a new base, fresh supporters trickled in, attracted by his reputation as an outlaw. Mao could reach out to people both individually and collectively. Uh, he was a great storyteller, for example. He also had a capacity for selecting the place where he would tell the story, so that in Yan'an especially, it was outside. There were caves behind him where people lived. The caves themselves had a certain primitiveness, which implied starting the world all over again the sound of horses, the clank of military gear, the shouting of soldiers in the distance. So that especially for young people just arriving in Yan'an, uh, there was a kind of, of magic. Yan'an became a communist liberated zone. And for the first time in years, Mao had the opportunity to reflect on what he'd learned. He wrote poetry and thought more carefully about revolutionary politics. I was very taken by him. From his speeches, I feel that he was better than the other Chinese leaders. Some of the others were trained in France or in the USSR, so their intellectual levels was different and we couldn't easily understand them. Most of us prefer Mao. Mao exploited his popularity. Behind the facade of the great leader, he was also a womanizer. Mao was very famous for both demanding rigid discipline on the part of his officers uh, and his cadres uh, with respect to women and women's rights, while himself literally plundering uh, uh, the situation. He, he was a, a famous philanderer. As new recruits arrived, Mao started an affair with one of them, an actress called Zhang Qing. He now deserted his wife for her. A year later, he married for the fourth time. He would remain with Zhang Qing for the rest of his life, though he would never be faithful to her either. Only later would it become clear Mao's callousness was part of his personality. At the time, it was excused by the pressures of war. 
By the late 1930s, Chiang Kai-shek's forces had moved up from the south and were, once again, on the point of launching a major attack. Help came from an unexpected quarter. China's old enemy, Japan, invaded, committing appalling atrocities against the civilian population. Mao seized the opportunity to forge an unlikely alliance with Chiang Kai-shek in the name of repelling the foreign invader. It came just in time. The Japanese invasion allowed Mao honorably and to, with much popular support in effect to force Chiang Kai-shek to desist from his attacks uh, on the communists and to form an anti-Japanese alliance. Three years later, China and Japan were sucked into World War II. America sent aid and advisors to help Mao fight the Japanese. At the end of the war, with American help, the communists had become stronger and better equipped than ever before. In 1949, after a series of running battles with government troops, Mao's communist guerrillas overran the country and marched into the capital, Beijing. The peasant revolution had triumphed. America had inadvertently helped arm the man who was to become one of the most powerful communist leaders in the world. Mao was 55 and the most successful guerrilla leader of the 20th century. But even bigger challenges lay ahead. On October 1st, 1949, in Beijing's Tiananmen Square, Mao Zedong proclaimed the birth of the People's Republic of China. It was the end of a 30-year civil war. On that day, we were asked to go to Tiananmen Square. I thought of Mao as a very great person and the savior of China, because at that time, uh, I had already witnessed much of the corruption of the Kuomintang. I admired him very much, and so did all my fellow students. I was very excited when I heard Mao say, I declare the People's Republic of China. I didn't know much about it, but in my child's heart, Mao gradually became a god. That fall, Mao traveled north to Moscow. It was his first ever trip abroad, and he was uncertain what to expect. But he was impatient to drag China into the 20th century and hoped his most important ally, the Soviet Union, would help. The Soviet leader, Joseph Stalin, however, kept him hanging around for weeks, and when the two men met, they didn't get on. Stalin had little interest in China, and Mao was angered by the high-handed way Stalin treated him. Despite the show of friendship, Mao left Moscow disillusioned with his Soviet ally. China would have to solve its problems alone. Back home, he kept his promise to the peasants and announced a sweeping land reform program. Large estates were seized from feudal landowners and divided up among the people who worked them. Landlords were publicly humiliated.
But in the cities, there was less popular support for the communists, and many people resented the rigid imposition of party rule. There was enormous resentment at the tough way in which the party treated anyone who wasn't a party member, the way in which they ran the country, particularly among the intellectuals, who had traditionally felt that they were part of the ruling elite and were now being t bossed around often by party officials who had a primary school education at best. Mao sensed the disquiet, and in 1956, he launched China's first ever experiment in democracy, an open invitation to the country's intellectuals to express their views. It was, he said, time to let a hundred flowers bloom, a hundred schools of thought contend. He expected, at the worst, mild criticism. Mao launched the um, flowers in the belief that he would give the intellectuals, students even, a safety valve to express their criticism and therefore they would be quite happy and satisfied. And he frankly felt that we've done not too badly the last several years, so why should there be any really strong criticism? But he had misjudged the mood. Huge posters appeared strongly criticizing the Communist Party. Mao was shaken by the severity of the criticism. Mao felt very nervous and threatened. As more and more posters appeared, he became increasingly uneasy. One of my friends, who was his secretary, told me Mao even became sick with the worry. It was the last time Mao ever consulted the Chinese people. Soon afterwards, he ruthlessly crushed those who had dared to speak up. Hundreds of thousands were labeled rightists and lost their jobs. Tens of thousands were sent to prison camps. One of them was a journalist called Liu Binyang, who'd suggested that the Communist Party should be more accountable. He found it hard to believe what was happening to him. I pleaded guilty because I didn't think Mao could be wrong. I thought I must be the one who had done something wrong. For two months, my newspaper ran articles denouncing me. I thought I was finished and I was sent to labor in the country. Over one million families were affected by the so-called anti-rightist purge. Liu Binyan's wife didn't see her husband for years. When Liu Binyan was labeled as a rightist, I was completely shocked and I was like uh, torn apart into two persons. I thought Mao couldn't be wrong. so. I must be wrong. So I tried very hard to, um, to conform to this idea that Liu Bing was a rightist. For many people, this was the moment Mao lost touch with reality and turned from a popular leader into a murderous and paranoid dictator. It was ridiculous. These rightists were not really rightists at all. A friend of mine was at a meeting. He didn't say anything, but he touched his head. So he became a rightist. Why? They told him, by touching your head, you are indicating that if you were to speak up, your head would be chopped off. So you are a rightist. But Mao no longer cared. Surrounded by yes-men, he was now free to pursue his personal vision. Few could have guessed where it would lead. In 1958, Mao left Beijing for one of his periodic tours of the country. He was impatient with the slow pace of change and worried that the revolution had lost its momentum. He felt it was time to shake up the country and rekindle the old enthusiasm. Mao was someone who believed in movement. 
he loved upheaval. He said so to his doctor uh, and it's quite clear from the way he behaved. That was part of his personality. It was part of why he liked the martial life, the guerrilla existence. That was what revolution was. As Mao roamed the country, he was suddenly struck by the huge potential of China's vast army of workers. If the country lacked modern machinery, it had more human muscle power than anywhere else in the world. That summer, he set about galvanizing it into action. He called it the Great Leap Forward, a massive mobilization of China's millions. To be fair to Mao, a lot of economists in the 1950s and 60s said that bootstrap development was the way to go, getting the peasants to build local industry. What was wrong was that he went overboard in what could be done. He heard Khrushchev saying he was going to overtake America in 15 years, so he said, well, we'll overtake some, we'll overtake Britain in 15 years. Badness. The effects were felt almost immediately. In the countryside, there was a huge reorganization of farming. In less than 12 months, 900 million peasants, almost four times the population of the United States, were pushed and cajoled into enormous collective farms. Grain production was expected to quadruple. But Mao had even bigger plans. The country needed to produce more steel. Why shouldn't China's millions help the country to jump decades and industrialize overnight? A decree went out. The country turned into a nation of steelmakers. That year, the night sky glowed orange as millions of tiny blast furnaces were built in every village and workplace. Many people had nothing to put in them. We went to the homes of our colleagues to collect uh, scrap metal. And later, we couldn't find any scrap metal. And we took the heater and just cracked them into scrap metal. It's really something, you, it's just unimaginably crazy. But we did all that. The Great Leap Forward turned into the greatest mobilization of human beings the world has ever seen. Reports poured in of fantastic increases in output. Mao wanted to hear good news, and with memories of the anti-rightist purges still fresh in the country's memory, nobody was willing to contradict him. Mao became deaf and blind. He was isolated and ill-informed, like an emperor in his palace. The following year, the truth seeped out. Most of the steel was useless. Worse, in the fervor to produce it, the harvest had simply not been collected for two years. In 1958, 59 or thereabouts, I had the impression that Mao was really divorced from the, the world around him, the Chinese people. He knew how to organize a revolution, but he did not know how to run a country. By the winter of 1959, as a result of Mao's ambitions, China had been pushed into an appalling famine. Whole villages died of starvation. When the grass and tree bark had gone, people were left with nothing at all to eat. When there was nothing else, they ate the bodies of the recently dead. I'll tell you a true story. A husband said to his wife, if we all try to survive, none of us will make it. I'm going to give you my food, and when I die, 
I want you to eat my body and raise our child. Nobody knows how widespread such cannibalism was. But recent estimates suggest around 40 million people died of hunger between 1959 and 1961. It was the worst man-made famine in history. But the scale of the disaster was concealed from the country. Only the Communist Party leadership knew the reality. Mao was quietly pushed to the sidelines, and his rival, Liu Shaoxi, a pragmatic politician, took over the running of the country. For the first time in 25 years, Mao was forced to take a back seat. He would spend the next five years plotting his return to power. In 1966, Mao, at the age of 73, took a well-publicized swim in the river Yangtze. For several years, he'd watched with dismay as China's new leadership undid his revolution. Now it was time to return to the political fray. The swim was his way of saying, look, I'm back. Later that year, he invited hundreds of thousands of school children and students to a series of enormous rallies in Beijing. He'd calculated the young remembered nothing about the famine, and that for them, he was still a national hero. People had this passion for Mao. They really did get emotional. They thought he was perfect. My classmates would go to these rallies, and they would go and stand for hours, just waiting for the moment when Chairman Mao would come out and wave, and he was godlike. Mao's thoughts, published in the early 1960s in a little red book, sent a wave of hysteria through China's young. There were broadcasts and newspapers every day promoting Mao and the Communist Party. We looked upon him as the savior of the Chinese. His image was everywhere in our lives. His slogans were everywhere. Anyone who had a chance to shake his hand would not wash their hands. They would not wash their hands for weeks. <laughs> and everybody else would want to touch their hand because this was the hand that touched Chairman Mao's. Mao was convinced the country's moderate leadership was reintroducing capitalism. With a total disregard for the normal process of political change, he urged the students to root out what he called capitalist roaders, by which he meant his political opponents. China was gripped by what became known as the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. Mao was a very purposeful manipulator of the political process. He was creating chaos very, very purposefully as a way of getting control of the party. He was not crazy. Uh, he understood that what he was doing in creating these conflicts was uh, weakening his opposition so that he could reestablish his own authority, his own control. Chaos spread through China like a whirlwind as Mao's Red Guards set about purging political moderates. Many of his victims were his traditional enemies, the intellectuals. Chen Yizi dared to write a letter to Mao calling for more democracy. I was taken over a hundred times to be denounced. I was beaten insensible three times. I was so exhausted, I could easily have died. And in fact, I didn't want to leave. Four members of my family were killed because I was accused of being a counter-revolutionary. Families were destroyed. Parents were pulled away from their children. 
in my husband's office, they were actually torturing people to death. They would wrap them in a quilt and, and beat them to death. And then they would throw their bodies out the windows and, and call it suicide. Mao was back in command. At a rally of the Communist Party in 1969, he received a hysterical welcome from his supporters. He had no qualms about exploiting his new popularity. As Red Guards swept through the country, he shamelessly indulged his old appetite for young women. You had to think of Mao as this rock singer multiplied by a factor of ten. You touch him, it's like, you know, you will never be the same again. Young women would want to be with him or serve him in any way. Two of my classmates would go and entertain him and they would go secretly, we didn't know, and they would go and stay in the Central Committee headquarters and go and entertain him. So that was not a problem for him to get young girls to sleep with him. By the end of the 1960s, over one million people had been killed or imprisoned by the Red Guards. Mao's opponents had been hounded out of power. Even he now realized it was time to restore order. The Red Guards were disbanded. Many were sent to cool off in the country. After years of chaos in China, Mao now sought to break the country's isolation in the world. It would be his last major initiative. In a characteristically audacious move, he turned to his arch enemy, the United States, and in 1972 invited the U.S. President Richard Nixon to Beijing for a landmark meeting. It was the first dialogue between the two countries for nearly three decades. Mao enjoyed Nixon's company, though the American delegation had difficulty making sense of what he said. Occasionally, Mao would make some comment that uh, you really never could grasp a hold of. It was too Delphic, uh, and we didn't know enough about the context that he was speaking to be able to interpret what he meant. But the Chinese were in the same situation. I mean, they were on shaky ground themselves, and they were probably a bit panicky that they would misinterpret Mao and get into hot water, get on his wrong side. It was the beginning of China's re-emergence into the world, but Mao's health was deteriorating, and he would never live to see the benefits of his diplomacy. On September 18, 1976, he died at the age of 83. China was devastated. And today, the Chinese people are still coming to terms with his legacy. His misjudgments led to the death of tens of millions of people. Looking at him this way, he was a great historical criminal. But he was also a great force for good. There were two sides to Mao's character. Without him, the revolution would not have been possible. But he was also devious and scheming. He was both a monster and a genius. The changing face of China is sure to be one of the main themes of the coming century. With China's continuing market reforms, the country has a chance at becoming an economic superpower despite its recent financial crisis. Yet China's human rights policies are still of major concern. There were positive indications of progress recently when China agreed to sign the United Nations Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which declares that all people have the right to self-determination and social, economic, and political freedom.
Whether China will follow through on those ideals is hard to say, but some observers hope it represents a softening of China's stance against dissenters. At the very least, it is a leap forward from the days of Mao Zedong.